causing or triggering or fueling the disease. You hear us, yeah. his patients, he'll ask his patients, what is it that you eat every day? <laughs> well, that's what do you crave every is. day? What food do you crave? Yeah. That's a good question. And so usually invariably that food is fueling their disease. It's Correct. inflaming them. Right. Now in my case, I finally, I got to the point where I've changed my diet, but I still didn't find out the major triggers until I performed a special food sensitivity test in the mid 90s. I then discovered two key foods I was eating every day. One of them I was eating at every meal and it was, I was highly severely sensitive to these foods. And one was gluten and the other was peppers. I was eating gluten every meal, not knowing that that was the main trigger for the disease. Flour. It is it's wheat. just flour, it's just flour, bread. Mm. It was in the form of cereal. <laughs> most, <laughs> yeah, right. most cereal it's in everything. is it's made of wheat. And how many people have a bowl of cereal before they go to bed? Right. But like an, an exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right now, again, gluten is found primarily in wheat products and rye products. Uh, those are the main, and uh, those are the main wheat pro uh, gluten foods that we eat. Is but, it, does it does it trigger reflux? It, in some people, it can trigger reflux, but what it triggers in so many is inflammation. Okay, and, and that's what I find. So you, so, you had, so your your body would actually feel like it would, that you were out in the sun for a long time. Was now, what was interesting is this reaction wouldn't occur immediately. It's not a food allergy where you feel it in yeah. seconds to minutes. Okay. This would occur hours, if not days later. But I was eating gluten at every meal, so I could never figure it out. Mm -hmm. And what happened, I craved pasta and crackers and you know, all bread and stuff. all the things, yeah. bagels yeah. and pretzels and things that are gluten foods. Oh yeah. And then what I also found is I found the other major thorn were peppers. Now peppers are a nightshade plant. Okay. And we find with many of our patients with autoimmune disease, such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus psoriasis. He keeps bringing me into this conversation. MS, autoimmune thyroid disease, we uh, colitis. Yeah. We find nightshades are many times a trigger. Now, nightshades are simply potatoes. Now, not everyone's sensitive to potatoes. Potatoes are least of these, usually. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes, peppers, bell pepper, cayenne pepper, pe um, any kind of pepper, pimento peppers. Paprika is another, an eggplant. And ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a nightshade that's an herb used in India that helps with stress. So we, f I found that those two foods were the key foods. Now what I did, I also at this time checked my GI tract and I found I had leaky gut. And this was when no one knew about leaky gut. Now, does that mean you had an x-ray? No, I did some special tests that were actually, I, it was a, a functional test where I could tell if my GI tract uh, was absorbing sugars it was not supposed Similar to be Similar to a stool testing. Okay, gotcha. Right, so I found out I had leaky gut. I found out I also had dysbiosis of the gut. I also had a uh, ileocecal valve that was open, so I had to have chiropractic therapy to adjust the sacroiliac joints to close the ileocecal valve. Has was that, is that much said what? The bowel? The ileocecal valve is simply the connection between the large and small intestines. Because some of those people so stay open. Stuff in. And so what happens? That valve is supposed to be shut. Right. When that valve stays chronically open, bacteria, yeast, fungus, viruses, whatever in the, in the large intestines where the majority of those reside will go up into the small intestine and they can create, create bacterial overgrowth with, with excessive bloating and gas and that's why when people eat, their, their, their tummy just swells yeah. up like they're pregnant. Yeah. Those people generally have an open ileocecal valve and bacterial overgrowth in the small intestines. So I had to close that off. You Simple just, way to close it. It's amazing. I, mean, <laughs> I hate to spread this up. <laughs> but a lot of women that you see, yes. they, they've got big guts. Right. And They're walking around with an open oil sequel bounce. I, I swear, right. I, I, I I think so. I've never noticed that before. The same They're fermenting. Yeah, They're like a brewery. Like a brewery, you know, when you make uh, wine, fine yeah. wine, you, you uh, ferment the, yeah. the grapes. Well, what's happened when you have a lot of those bad bacteria and yeast in the small intestine, they're fermenting their sugars and their starches to alcohol, and they're creating lots of gases, lots of water. Of course, men have always had a big gut. You know, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's like, but, but I, I haven't seen as many women, you, you oh. watch them in the malls, for goodness sakes, and it's like, yeah. and they're, maybe it's because they're wearing these tight things now, 
But I'm telling you, they got wolves that are flying. Well, well, what's happening? It used to be yeah. just the rear end. You'd see big yeah, rear ends, yeah. but now you see both, right? Exactly. What's happened? Average waist size in a woman over the past 20 years or so has gone from about a lean 30 inch waist to an average about 35 inch waist in a woman. And men have gone up from about 35 to about 39. Are they so, trying to change the style because they all have it? Well, again, this is part of the foods we're eating, the stress, so, the antibodies. So what causes everything. that again, that, that, that bloating? Blood? Yeah. Well, it's a combination of factors. Again, it's wheat, it's sugars, excessive wheat, excessive sugars. Many of them have increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Many of them have an open ileocecal valve. Many of them, they don't exercise, they're overstressed, they have the high cortisol content, they're not sleeping well. So it's a number of factors that have come together. And so doing sit-ups will not take No, <laughs> no sit-ups. No, you've got to do a combination of things. If you have that abdominal bloat, and especially if you're eating sugars and starches and you just blow it up and swell up, and if that's you, there's a good chance you have severe dysbiosis in the small, especially small intestines and bacterial overgrowth and or yeast overgrowth. A lot of yeast is due to antibiotics. Can't you? Easy to fix. We fix it all. Pretty much diagnose yourself and knowing what foods you're are sure. not good. Yes, it's that. easy. It's usually cut out anything. the sugars. Yes, the sugars yeah. and the grains, eat especially the wheat and the corn. I, mean, I, I know what yes. I feel like when I eat right. the food that I shouldn't have eaten. Right. Right away. Uh, it doesn't take long before sure. I know, you know and, that wasn't good for and me. And especially those people that have a lot of bloating and gas, they will have to really limit their beans, peas, lentils, and cruciferous veggies which are very healthy, or they have to take Beano, just over-the-counter Beano, mm -hmm. usually at least two or three a uh, few minutes before eating any beans, peas, lentils, or cruciferous veggies, such as broccoli, and cabbage, and cauliflower. Mm -hmm. So you know what's happened is Monsanto, Monsanto? Monsanto. Monsanto owns the seeds to most of our... Uh, they're the producers. They're the producers of the wheat. Grains and, and the grains and pastas and stuff like that. And what they've done, and I hope that they'll hear our voices in America, they will reverse this. They, they hibernize our wheat. Wheat used to grow 10 feet tall, which was the natural wheat of rain. that God made. Yeah. But what they did is because America is the breadbasket to the world, they referred to it, is they made the seeds so that they would be resistant to pesticides drought. and drought as well as um, the herbicides that they put on it. Mm -hmm. So they built this hardy, hardy uh, dwarf, wheat. dwarf wheat now mm -hmm. that is hardy to these other things but it's hurting us. Oh my yeah, that's our problem. Yeah. Uh, hey Dave, can we show the, some, of the, some of the products and then we can put up the website and the number and so forth? Because this also you have. In other words, people can go to your website, right? right. Mm -hmm. Find out. This is how I, this is how he heals his gut. I had to do it juicing back then because there was no product available yeah. then. Mm -hmm. And plus, uh, any product that did have greens back then had the nightshades that were my arch enemy to my uh, to fueling the psoriasis I had. But within three to four months of changing, restoring my GI tract, and then eliminating the wheat or the gluten, as well as the uh, peppers, within three or four months, psoriasis was gone, totally gone. And I have helped countless hundreds of patients with psoriasis and other autoimmune disease. I start with healing the gut. And again, remove the thorn, generally speaking, and the body can heal, but you need to restore the gut. And what, the way to restore it is using fermented vegetables that are pre-digested. We have the only greens. I thought all of the, all of the nutrients were taken out when you do that. Does no, that no, no, no. When you ferment, what we have, we have with the only fermented greens right we're now we're in, in the world. world. And what we've done is we fermented our grasses our uh, wheat grass, barley grass, oat grass, spirulina, chlorella, as well as our vegetables, which includes our broccoli, spinach, kale, collard greens, cabbage, and we fermented all of these, which means they're pre-digested, which means literally they have, they've broken these down to so, so the nutrition is so bioavailable